All right, there we go. I think we are good to go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode number seven. Man, the time flies. Been doing this for seven weeks already, and uh, this week has um, quite a lot of really cool news. So let's get going, I guess. Um, I already published the document on GitHub as usual, so you can find it in BXGS Weekly repository. If you are watching this on YouTube, there should be a link uh, in the description of the video to the document. So you can look it up there. We have quite a lot of really cool things going on today. So let's get started. Um, the first article is uh, named I was not ready to become the maintainer of the ba Babel. It's uh, by Henry Zhu, who is now the core maintainer of the Babel uh, and who taken the project over after Sebastian McKenzie. And uh, he talks about his experience of essentially taking over a very big project and becoming a main core maintainer of the project and main maintainer, right? It is a very interesting insight into how that actually works and um, how, how, how do you feel about it and, you know, sort of the mental side, I guess, of the whole thing. So if you're interested in that, definitely do have a look or if you're interested in trying something like that out. It's a very interesting perspective. Um, Continuing things, we have a new uh, gist from uh, Dr. Rauschmeier. Uh, it is this time around, it's about strings. So you got the string prototype um, methods, whatever you can imagine. Again, really cool format. I really like that. So with uh, ES uh, specs, uh, standards and all the examples and everything. So it gives you a pretty good overview of all the methods that you could use within JavaScript with strings. Um, and, you know, if you are... Um, need a refresher or need some sort of a cheat sheet for your work. This is a really good, um, really good one. Yeah. So basically go start if you like it. Right. Continuing, we got the truly understanding a sync await article. Uh, more than talking about a sync await, it actually talks about promises. Once again, if you still don't understand promises and if you still don't understand a sync await, this is a very good introduction to the whole thing. Why do we need promises? How do they work? And how does a sync await works, how a sync functions work, how a wait works, what you can do with it, and so on and so forth. So it's actually a very in-depth insight. And again, if you still don't understand it completely, then this is a definitely one of the better write-ups that you could read about that. Uh, continuing, we got a very, very large article called I built a progressive web app and published it in three app stores. Here's what I learned. Um, so as you can see here, the article is huge, absolutely enormous. And it talks exactly what you expect it will talk about, publishing Progressive Web App to three app stores, uh, Apple, Google, and Microsoft. The experience of author into the problems he encountered during the process, what was the process of submission, what was the process of review, and so on and so forth. It is uh, very interesting to read about all of that stuff. It is very interesting to see the comparison between the Apple, Google, and Microsoft approaches. Like the Apple's $99 a year for iOS App Store is still absolute bollocks in my opinion. But hey, you know, they, they kind of still have the majority of the market and they are still dominated. So there's no other way to do that. Um, HTML5 API and Safari are still kind of garbage and... Uh, have a lot of limitations, but uh, yeah, it's like, it's, it's anyway, you know, it's all my kind of subjective opinion. Obviously I haven't touched Apple platform in quite a lot of time. I uh, haven't been building anything for iOS. Uh, yeah, that's like limitations. Like, you know, you need a Mac to do that. That's, that's actually why in the first place I have my own MacBook Pro. So because I was building iOS apps. So it is really interesting to read about the state of those ecosystems and see how exactly that works. So if you are interested in publishing your own app and want to see the experience of um, other people, then this is definitely a very interesting write-up with a lot of details and a lot of uh, in-depth insights into that stuff. Right, continuing, we got another article from Cansey Dots. He's a very productive guy in that um, area. And this time around, we got an article called How to React. It's an article that talks about how you approach learning React and uh, how do you um, learn things that are indirectly related to React in a way that won't get you overwhelmed by the whole ecosystem and the React itself, right? So you start by basic JavaScript, modern JavaScript, then you go into React, go into dependencies NPM, learn the routing, learn the state management, 
bonnet styling and so on and so forth. This, uh, this is a pretty in-depth guide, like most of it is just links to the relative resources because all of that has been taught more than one time. But if you still learning this or if you don't know where to start, if you ever wanted to start a React, this is a really great guide on how to actually do that. So do have a look at that. All right, continuing, we got, um, we got another article on uh, new context API to React. This one's called how to use React's new context API to easily manage models, uh, written by Bogdan Soar. I hope I do not pronounce that name incorrectly. Um, right, so the um, article talks exactly about what you expect, using context API to manage the models within the React, right? Uh, it shows that this new context API is an incredibly powerful uh, method of actually managing the models because first of all, you can use the model provider and nest the model root, both the model root and model consumer within it, which would communicate using that context, which is actually a really cool idea. So if you are interested in more details, do have a look at the article. It's uh, actually really, really good. Continuing, we got a new video series from the uh, Mozilla uh, Hacks guys. This one is called Web Demystified. Um, it is just two videos right now. So the first one is the web itself. It's sort of a general video. What is the web, you know, and sort of explains how it works uh, in a very general way. And the next video is HTML. So it talks exactly about what you expect, HTML and anything related to it. They do plan to talk about other stuff like JavaScript, SVG, WebAssembly, and all that kind of thing. So uh, knowing them, it's gonna be very in-depth, very cool, and very well made. You know, like I never saw any, uh, I think, poor content from the Mozilla guys. So they're always up to par and then have very great stuff. So again, if you're starting out or if you're interested in a refresher, then this is probably the series to keep an eye on. All right, continuing. We got a whole debate going on about uh, JavaScript names. So if you did not know, JavaScript as a name actually um, is, or sort of belongs to Oracle, right? So Oracle claimed a trademark infringement on an iOS JavaScript editor and it was removed from a store. There's like a whole article here, as well as a bunch of discussions here. So we got this Reddit article or Reddit post, I guess, from the user iMac Pro One that says that um, his app has been taken down from Apple Store, from App Store, Apple App Store, um, for using the word JavaScript in the title of the app, right? And it looks like technically Oracle actually owns the trademark for it. The problem is that it might not hold up in court because it's so widely used name, but that's, that means that there should be someone who wants to fight Oracle for it and has a lot of money to do that, right? Because Oracle is a very large company and they have a lot of uh, money and a lot of very angry lawyers. So um, aside from typical fuck Oracle comments, there's actually a very good and very interesting discussions uh, on Reddit. In the second post on Reddit, here's this sort of a sum up of um, whatever the story, this Tech Republic post that I shared and then the uh, post that I shared before that, some additional stuff, tweets and things. And uh, people suggesting different solutions to it essentially from changing the name to something to calling it just JS because that's not trademarked to trying to actually challenge Oracle in court and say that this is now public domain because it's so widely used, which is actually apparently a thing you could do. But uh, once again, as I said, we need someone has a lot of money to try and pull that off. And there's also a discussion on hacker news that uh, pretty much goes in the same. So um, the interesting thing is I, I, for example, didn't know why it was called ECMAScript and this is exactly the reason because Oracle is the current owner of JavaScript. So actually, if they wouldn't own it, it would be called not ECMAScript, but it would be called JavaScript, which is pretty interesting. And I didn't know I like I never actually thought about why it was called ECMAScript. So yeah, definitely some very interesting insights here. As usual, if you are interested in the topic do have read through there are some very cool things here and there. Uh, but yeah, let's continue. Uh, next article we have is from Visual Studio Code guys. It is called Text Buffer Reimplementation. And it talks about changes uh, or the brand new text buffer system and implementation that they shipped in VS Code 
121, which was, I believe, uh, a couple of months ago. So it's definitely not the latest one. And uh, you would think that, you know, text buffer is such a simple thing that it should be relatively straightforward to implement, but um, apparently it, it is extremely complex. So it is a very well written article that goes very in depth on the whole text buffer and what it is, how it works, how they how it worked before the implementation, why they re-implemented it and how they actually increased the performance of it. So there are some really nice charts that show you the memory usage. And as you can see here, the uh, piece tree implementation is um, basically on par by efficiency with it, just the plain file size. And this line array that they used before is like very, like almost double is inefficient as it is, uh, is the piece tree, right? So same goes uh, for the file opening time. It's, it's significantly cut down for the, after the change in the um, implementation, which is really cool. And you know, I love articles like this because they give you insight on how the editor is written. This is, I wish the Adam guys would write something like this, but uh, I don't think I've ever saw anything, um, it, or I guess not as much as the VS Code guys do in terms of the blogging content. So it's like, it's really cool to see something like this. All right, continuing. We got an article from Malte Ubel, uh, designing very large JavaScript applications. Um, he is a guy working at Google, uh, specifically on JavaScript infrastructure, I believe. Uh, yes, he is. Yeah, he is also a tech lead of AMP project. And he is a very smart person who does some very cool things, right? So this article, uh, it's basically a transcript of his talk where you can watch on YouTube as well if you prefer that to the text. And um, the whole article, as you can see, it's quite long. It's more, um, so I wouldn't call it specifically JavaScript article, right? So even though it does touch some JavaScript areas, this is why exactly the JavaScript is taken in the quote in brackets here. It is mostly an article about approaching building large applications in general and not as much from the development perspective, from the code perspective, as much it is the approach to building uh, large JavaScript, uh, large applications from the um, sort of senior level, uh, senior develop, senior, let me try to phrase that again, from the senior developer level, right? So how do you interact with people? How do you think about APIs? How do you think about how people will use your APIs? How do you think about architecture? And it's absolutely fascinating to read something like this from a uh, person working at Google at something enormous, right? So he gives an examples of very simple things here that they did at Google, like a uh, currency converter or the weather widget that you see in search. You would think that those are really simple and straightforward widgets, but it is kind of insane how much works go into just creating this. And it is, yeah, so it's, it's really fascinating to read. And you know, if you don't like reading well, there's a link to YouTube, just have a listen and uh, I think everyone would find something useful for them here um, disregarding the experience or the uh, years of work that you could have in JavaScript. Uh, hey, Anko255, welcome to the stream. All right, let us continue. We got the next article. Uh, it's called Traversing Dawn with JavaScript and uh, it's a very good introduction to um, how you could actually traverse the DOM and why you would need to do that and how exactly you can do it with the modern JavaScript with the basic stuff like, you know, DOM document query selector and uh, children accessor array, converting the array of HTML collection to actually a normal array that you can iterate over and stuff like this, traversing upwards as well. So getting the parents and stuff like this. So if you, uh, for example, use J um, jQuery, right, but did not know how to do some things without jQuery, like traversing DOM, but wanted to learn it really hard, then this is an article for you because it explains quite well the modern methods of doing that and uh, shows how to basically uh, uh, traverse up and down, how to get siblings and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty in-depth um, pretty in-depth article it is quite basic, so it is on a very basic level, but if you need a refresher or if you want to learn that, it's a really, really solid one. Okay, continuing. We got a view into how some Node.js projects address security challenges. Uh, this one is essentially a survey, so 
collection of existing uh, cases in this case um, that talk about security concerns, how do projects tackle this security and uh, what kind of tools they use, what kind of use cases they had and so on and so forth. So if you are looking into securing the project, um, this is definitely the article treats. What script blocker I'm using? I'm using two things. I'm using the uBlock origin, which blocks all the ads and all the other annoying bollocks. And I'm using the uMetrics that blocks just about all the scripts aside from the ones that I decide that are permitted and the first party are allowed by default. This is my favorite combination. And uh, if you are interested, there is, I will take some time off and I will uh, share a video that I did on this specific topic because I think it's a very important topic um, where I talked about using these two tools to make your web experience better essentially. Well, if I will find it right now, you block, can I know ad block? No. Script, no, where is it? Come on, I know it's somewhere there. No, ad block, come on. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, I know it's somewhere there, wait a second. Give me, I just need a few seconds. Um, I think it was in specials, um, off topic episodes maybe. GraphQL, Apollo, tech, testing, introduction. Yeah, there you go, okay. So if you know that is too long, can I just uh, please get a um, short shareable link? So there you go. Um, um, I, that's like literally my two favorite tools and I don't go online without them. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, for example, Facebook knows only the things that I I allow it to know about me, right? So they, they I'm, I will actually come to that point because we have some news related to that this time around. So let us continue talking about news. Um, we got Node.js 10 upcoming. Uh, it's gonna be released by the end of this month. I believe actually in just a couple of days, if I remember correctly. And uh, this article is from the Node Source guys. It's called what you can expect from Node 10. And it talks essentially about what's gonna be in there. So there's the NRP is no longer experimental. We got HTTP 2 full support. We got ASM support. I think it's no longer gonna be behind the flag, so you're just gonna be able to use it. We got the new async hook stuff, and we got the new LTS coming in October, which is, I mean, still a long way out, but uh, hey, you know, LTS releases are always great. So yeah, uh, if you're interested in more details, go ahead and read the article. There's plenty of links that describe the each and every of those changes in quite a lot more details. So. It's uh, something you're interested in, go ahead and read through. All right, next thing we have is uh, from the same node source guys, understanding the buffer deprecation in node 10. So there was some uh, changes uh, for the buffer constructor before you could just use the new buffer, which was deprecated now. And this article basically goes in length to uh, explain why was it deprecated and how you can fix it. I mean, the fix is actually very straightforward. You just change it to buffer from most of the time. And that just works. Um, there's also like buffer lock, lock and safe uh, that you might be need to use in some cases. But um, yeah, uh, you know, if you used it, you know that basically you need that and you probably already heard about it. But uh, because as far as I heard, there was quite a significant problem for some projects and some people maintaining open source stuff. But it's definitely interesting to read about that. Um, all right, let us continue. We got another thing from uh, Mozilla Hacks guys. It is called Hello Vasm Pack, and essentially it's a tool introduction. So you know that uh, the Mozilla guys uh, own both projects, or kind of not own, own is a bad word. So they created Rust, right? Which is this low level language that's supposed to replace C++. And the language is now used for the new Firefox, for example. And they also were ones behind the WebAssembly, right? Because they were the ones who suggested the ASM.js spec and then they were the ones who pushed WebAssembly uh, together with the Google, obviously, but um, and Safari guys, but hey. Uh, so they are now spending a lot of time. Um, um, okay, let just give me a second. Uh, I tried finding extension stuff used on the website, but couldn't find them. You should have page for gear or users in your website. 
uh, that is a good idea. I will do that. So I already have a um, short description of what I use on my YouTube channel, but I haven't thought actually about putting that on Twitch. I should probably do that. That is a good point. Thank you. I will do that after the stream. Okay, so coming back to the Mozilla guys. Um, they, uh, so yeah, they, they created Rust. They use it for Firefox development. They supported WebAssembly quite heavily invested in a lot, right? Rust now has a lot of tools that allow you to compile Rust to WebAssembly. And uh, last time we talked about this uh, Vasm bind gen, right? It allows you to bind the Rust, uh, to call the JavaScript stuff from Rust, which is quite incredible. But now it's like it's still quite annoying or was quite annoying to package and ship the WebAssembly code to Java ecosystem from Rust ecosystem, right? Because those are two completely different ecosystems. That might be annoying. Well, they created this Vasm pack thing that essentially allows you to assemble and package Rust crates, which is the Rust packages format, uh, and publish them directly into NPM, which is insane. Like when you think, so you just take the Rust stuff, you write it in Rust, and then you just say, hey, publish this stuff to NPM, and you're done. And this is the kind of tooling that I think will bring us the widespread WebAssembly adapt adoption. Uh, obviously, you know, Rust is a pretty complicated language. It, I mean, it is there to replace the C++, so it's kind of expected. I'm really looking forward to a Golang adoption of the WebAssembly, which should be shipped in the next major version, or not major, minor version, is it? Is it minor? But yeah, basically next Golang release. But anyway, it's really cool to see more tools that make it easier to write WebAssembly. All right. Uh, next article is called React Meets D3. It's from Victor Mora, and it talks about uh, using D3.js from React as a reusable component, right? Um, the trick here is that to use D3.js, you actually need to call the DOM, right, to uh, query, or to, not to query, to hook directly into the DOM, while React doesn't actually, this is not how you do it in React, right? This is not a React way. So this article talks about the approach that allows you to do that and to hook your D3 within the React to get those really nice D3.js charts. So if you were ever, if you if you don't have a complete understanding of how you could do that, which is, you know, it's not exactly a complicated process, it's more or less straightforward. So if you wanted to learn that, then this article does explain it quite well. And additionally, links to a bunch of pretty nice libraries that um, work with uh, D3 or related to this process, like the DOM-like structures that renders to React, for example, that you can use from D3. So um, yeah, it is pretty cool, pretty in-depth right, um, right up on using D3 from React. Uh, again, if you're interested, do have a look. Okay, continuing. Ah, there we go. This is the Facebook topic, uh, Facebook data. Um, why are you zooming in so weirdly? Okay, there we go. That looks nice. Okay, so uh, the article is called No Boundaries for Facebook Data. Third-party trackers abuse Facebook login. So <laughs> here's the thing. On one hand, Facebook has incredible engineers who created React, React Native, and a bunch of other really, really cool open source libraries that are straight up amazing, right? On the other hand, they have guys who created those Facebook login widgets that apparently are abusable. So what you can do is you can use that widget even if user is not logged in or I know, I think it, it has to be logged in. But basically what you can do is you can use third-party JavaScript to get user ID, email, gender, username, and some other, like, I, I think there was like even more stuff. Like, yeah, I mean, the, the worst stuff is email and username and, and like user ID is like maybe not so hard, but I guess if you have the user ID, you can then try to scrape it from Facebook. So basically, you don't even need to have direct access to this Facebook login widget. And you can still collect the data about the user visiting your website through that widget, which is just insane. There's like the demonstration of the vulnerability. And you can use that same widget to track users around the web, which is even more insane. So you don't even have to install your own widget, you can just abuse Facebook one. <laughs> 
And there is one more um, reason why I use uBlock that just blocks all the third party stuff unless I allow it to explicitly, right? So this prevents crap like this. And yeah, so, you know, be safe and at least block the Facebook tracking widgets through your ad blocker. So it's like, it's just crazy. Okay, continuing, we got, um, this is more of a preview than a full fledged news. So there's a new pull request landed in NPM that is probably gonna be shipped with NPM six and it is NPM init. So this is essentially a shortcut for NPX, right? But I think it looks way more organic and it allows you to do cooler, like, or uh, I guess initialize the things in a nicer way. So, npm init create react, uh, react app. So this is essentially gonna execute create react app, npm init ESM gonna execute ESM. You will get the um, uh, new project with the package JSON generated and with the ESM pre-installed. And again, react app, you're gonna get the react app initialized for you in your folder that you called. It's a nice, like it's a syntactic sugar essentially, but I think it's really neat. So it's basically like this, right? So it's like, not much change, but I think it's a really nice shortcut, uh, which is always welcome to have in NPM. All right, continuing, we got the, speaking of fab layouts, introducing the magic hat technique. So this is not exactly the technical article, I guess. It is, it is JavaScript and web related, uh, but it is more of um, layout and sort of design UX article than anything else talks about the way that you structure your views. So, and the idea of the, uh, this idea of minimal usable view is something that appeals a lot to me. And the general gist of the article is that at any time on your screen, you should have two views at most, right? So you have the list and then you, when you click something on the list, you get a second view that interacts with the list. The way it works when you have a lot more views is that they kind of shift and replace each other, right? So you go like up or down or whatever. And I, I find this idea absolutely great and it looks really cool. I really like it. And uh, what this article introduces is uh, this magic hat technique, which is sort of the way that you pull the second view out of the first view, right? This kind of the magic hat, as far as I understood at least, maybe, maybe I'm just overthinking it. But uh, there is a demo and obviously there is a React Magic Hat library that actually allows you to do that. It is a CSS transform base, so 60 plus FPS, GPU accelerated uh, with all the nice stuff. It is just 6.5 kilobytes and no external dependencies, which is always nice. So if you are looking into making your user experience better, then definitely have a look at that. This is a very solid article and a very cool technique that is very easy to apply actually, to be honest. So yeah. That's basically the gist of it. Okay, continuing. We got a article called Understanding React JS Render Props from Richard Kotze. Um, and you know, React Render Props has been all the hype lately. And uh, if you still don't understand it, this is a very good, uh, yet another very good explanation of how they work and why you should use them with a pretty cool example of a component. Uh, so refactoring of the component. So he has this list of contributors component that has fetch <clears throat> within the component itself and then uses the set state basically to set the state and then render it as a contributor profile. And then he refactors that component into two components. One of them fetches the contributors and uses render props to pass those contributors to the contributor list which basically is, you know, it's a very much uh, way more concise and way more um, declarative way of doing things. So I think it's a really good solid example on why render props might be useful and how to use them exactly. Again, downshift yeah, is probably the basic, uh, like the best exam, not basic, the best example of how the render props work and why you should use them. But uh, yeah, once again, if you still don't understand render props do have a look and have a read through, it is a pretty cool uh, case explanation basically. All right, let's go uh, to the next one. Okay, we got the tool from, um, what was it? The JS Foundation, I think it was. Uh, hell if I remember, I, where you, I picked it up on Twitter somewhere. I think it was from JS Foundation guys. I might be terribly mistaken though. So I will not say basically, 
It's a tool called Sonarwall. I hope I read that correctly. I really like the name. So um, it's a JavaScript or I guess web development or website assessment tool that is a rule based that gives you a rule based assessment. So this is how the dashboard looks. And uh, if you ever saw the Lighthouse, for example, that it does the progressive web apps assessment, this is more or less this, but it supports extensible rules, right? So you can have your own rule sets that uh, test for something. So there's the default web recommended uh, set, for example, and you can also uh, change or add or ignore rules, the ones that you don't like. So essentially it's automated testing for your website to make sure everything works as expected and your site follows the best practices, essentially. If you need something like this, do we have a look? Looks pretty neat. I um, yeah, have not tried it myself yet, but it does look like a pretty cool tool. All right, continuing. We got the Pico.js, a face detection library in 200 lines of JavaScript. So this is essentially a um, walkthrough through the library that does uh, face detection in literally 200 lines of JavaScript, which is really cool. So, and it's quite actually quite fast because it's like it handles it on 200 plus FPS. Uh, you can even use it with a webcam. There's a webcam demo and it's just two kilobytes uh, minified if you get, as you can imagine, because it's literally 200 lines of JavaScript. It's a really cool uh, walkthrough on how you do the phase detection. How you can actually do that yourself. It is literally building the library from scratch and literally figuring out how the phase detection works. So if you ever was interested in stuff like this, do have a look. I mean, it's not extremely large article, but the code is very concise, very easy to understand. So yeah, it is a really, really cool uh, example case, I guess. All right, continuing, we got the AST for JavaScript developers. Um, this again, article covering the talk from uh, Stockholm meetup, if I think you can check out the slides and it's probably a video on YouTube somewhere, but if you prefer text, then this is a very solid introduction to the abstract syntax tree. So if you didn't know the abstract syntax tree is something that you can basically represent just about any programming language in. So it's not just JavaScript related thing, you can convert almost all languages to abstract syntax tree and represent the code in it. The cool thing is that abstract syntax tree allows you to do some crazy things. So like here's a basic example, right? So we got the function. And you can see that okay, we have a function declaration, it has the identifier that has params that has this body and then the body can be something like in this case is a block statement. It also can be another function declaration, right? Um, the cool thing is that you can do a lot of crazy things with it. Uh, so the, the article goes to introduce the lexical analyzer, syntax analyzer, and so on and so forth. Talk about the tools that you have, talk about the Babel, because Babel uses the AST quite heavily. Um, another example of a tool that uses AST is the um, Prettier, because the Prettier takes your code, deconstructs it into AST, and then re-renders it from AST using the specific rules which is why it works so well. So uh, yeah, if you ever wanted a dip, oh yeah, they mentioned Prettier, there you go. If you ever wanted to get a deep dive into the uh, AST and JavaScript code parsing with all the things related to it, like IR and flow trees and shape trees and all that stuff, then there's a really good article for that. Um, do have a look. Okay, uh, no um, Facebook medium I want, do that. Okay. Learn to visualize data with this 3 d 3 js course. Uh, this is more or less literally what you expect to be. This is a D3.js course with like links to the videos and everything. And uh, if you never use D3.js, it's a really, really good starting point for you to figure out um, how exactly it works and what you can actually do it. And, um, you know, it's free. So if you ever wanted to do data visualization, I still think I said it once I said, I will say it more. I'll still think that D3.js is one of the best, if not the best visualization libraries for JavaScript. So do have a look at that. Okay, continuing, we got the article called extending native DOM elements with web components. Um, if you didn't know, Web Components is an official spec that is now supported by most of the browsers. I think almost all of them, I said maybe from the some very old mobile ones. 
and it allows you to create your custom elements. Uh, probably something is blocked over here. So let me try to unblock that real quick. Why don't you want to unblock things? There we go. Can you show the embed? Uh, yes, you are blocked too. I'm gonna allow you. There we go. Can we get the code now, please? Okay, we got the stack. Another stack bleeds domain. Of course, they have more than one domain. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. So you can actually create your own custom HTML elements and render them within the uh, your code, right? So I don't think they have any. This is just index.js. Can I switch the can I switch the files here? Or is it literally just one file? Doesn't doesn't seem like those embeds work out very well. But uh, yeah, basically the the article goes in depth into what the custom elements are, what the shadow DOM is, uh, and how does all of that gets together. So if you never heard of it, it's a really good introduction. Uh, I don't think they talk about the Polymer framework, which is the Google's um, sort of thing that's uh, kind of like polyfill, but on the other hand, also kind of like completely standalone framework. But again, you know, if you never heard about web components, and if you wanted to do a deep dive into it, this is a really cool place, uh, like a good place to start. All right, continuing, we got immutable JS is intimidating. Here's how to get started. Literally what it says, it's a getting started article for immutable JS. If you don't know what immutable JS is, it is a library for creating immutable data structures, and it can be immensely useful. Uh, if you ever work with Redux, the Redux used to recommend that to be used everywhere, essentially, I don't know if it's the case now. But uh, yeah, this is like a really powerful library that can do some very cool things. Uh, but you know what, immutable data structures is something I want to see in the core of JavaScript. There's been a couple of uh, ongoing, at least attempts to do a proposal for TC39 for that. But I don't actually know what stage they are at. Uh, D3 course is from Scrimba. They're constantly producing free courses. Okay, did no, I didn't I actually never heard about them. But it's really cool. So yeah, if, if, if they produce free courses, it's always welcome. That's always really cool to hear. All right, uh, continuing, we got, oh yeah, that's the, I think the last article or sort of related article, I guess, for, for today, it's called uh, VS Code Can Do That. And it's a website that is a collection of things that uh, show off the things that VS Code can do, essentially. Starting from image resizing, emits, wrapping lines, prettier, font ligatures, I, by the way, still don't understand how you can work with this. I just prefer normal code, but I know some people like that. Uh, bracket pair colorizer. This is something I really want to install for my uh, VS Code next time because that looks really, really cool. Because sometimes I have a really hard time distinguishing between brackets, even though I'm not writing a list, but still, you know. Type checking in JavaScript using the TypeScript checker. JSON IntelliSense, Node.js debugging, browser debugging, log points, the thing that I covered in the last big JS podcast. We got Cosmos MongoDB extension. This is actually really cool. I tried it. It works really well. Uh, bookmarking, Docker integration, setting syntax, and deployments to Azure. I'm sadly only to Azure for now, I believe, but uh, still really cool that I actually have that integration there. So yeah, uh, really cool collection. I believe they're gonna be extending it. And uh, I'm kind of surprised they didn't do the GitHub for it so that people can send like pull requests with new things. But you know, still, still a really cool um, showcase essentially of what it can do. Okay, now we are here in the releases part. So we got quite some releases this time around. So I think there's like five or six of different things that are actually major releases. So if you are working with Ember, then you already probably know that, but the Ember 3.1 and 3.2 beta versions has been released with, uh, it seems like some quite major changes here and there, non-breaking ones, but still major changes. So yeah, again, I don't think I ever worked with Ember. I never even tried it, to be honest, because it seems to be more of this sort of a Ruby world thing which is quite distant from me, but I heard good things about it, especially the latest versions. So, you know, if it's your cup of tea, do have a look. 
All right, next thing we got is Hyper 2. So this is something I'm really hyped for, pun non intended. Um, if you never heard about Hyper, it's a terminal built using Electron.js. It is very fast. It is really, really cool. It is now, um, like, yeah, it's obviously extensible. And this is like my primary terminal that I use in Windows, for example, because everything else is just terrible. Um, the cool thing is that new version is using the canvas based rendering engine, which allows you to do some high performance rendering, which was the problem in the previous version. I think this part is actually from VS code as well, because they use, they have this, like the, the really cool terminal integrated in VS code is on the, um, branched out the engine itself. And now it's used by more than one project, which is cool. They now have online catalogs of plugins and themes, which was uh, something long time needed. I actually expected those catalogs to be within the terminal itself, but it wasn't there, but uh, you know, whatever, that's not a critical thing. You can now use the Hyperkli to install plugins and themes, which is, I guess, also nicer than just uh, running it manually. And there's some additional improvements. Uh, yeah, I guess this rendering is the most important thing. Um, you know, you can pause the screencast and edit the code on the screen in the screen by screencasts. Uh, no, I did not know that, but that sounds really cool. Does it actually changes the execution as well? So like, can you edit the code and then wait a second? Now. I'm curious now, Scrimba, Scrimba, there we go. Okay, introduction to JavaScript, let's see. Let me uh, enroll for, uh, no, I, I, mean, I don't wanna log in. Can I just, can, can you just play? And just be like, hey, I don't want your stuff. Overlay, yes. Can I just press play now? Yes, I can. Right, well. Oh, <laughs> so their, regist <laughs> their registration is not exactly mandatory, eh? Okay, so let's see, where's the source code? That does not have any source code. Okay, variables, that should have a source code, right? Let me kill the backdrop because I don't need it. Okay, let me mute him and uh, let's see. So I pause it and then, oh, that is really cool. Okay. Um, enter playground, click play. That, you know, that is actually, so I can say example. That is awesome. Like that is straight up awesome. How do they record that? Like, wait, is that a literal? Okay, this is, this is really cool. Thank you for pointing that out, but this is like amazing. Okay, elements, and let me inspect that. Like this is a literal editor over here. And if I press play, it's still in it. So they record, it seems like the recording software they have is actually recording the specific commands. That's an interesting approach. That's really cool. Okay, so yeah, definitely a very impressive piece of software. Okay, returning to Hyper. Um, yeah, the first version used to have a problem with this Parrot Live when I curled it. Uh, I think I did it live on one of the podcasts and it had like problems with glitching. Now it works actually perfectly fine. Um, themes, plugins, all that stuff is less exciting than the improvements for rendering, I guess. So yeah, I am actually want to try it again for my Mac as my main terminal because I'm hoping they fix that issue with disappearing terminal when it like dropped down from the top, you know, I had this like quake like terminal and uh, it, it used to just disappear after some time. I don't know if it was a garbage collection issue or something, but I want to try the second one. Maybe they fix that problem and see, you know, if that actually works out. Okay. Next release we have is a Webpack version 4.6 for a uh, point oh. uh, most of the stuff is actually improvements uh, on stats and some additional performance improvements. So nothing major here. I mean, it is a minor release, a uh, bunch of bug fixes as well, but you know, it's really cool to see Webpack uh, releasing so many new versions, which is, you know, really great to see the project developing. <coughs> All right. Next thing we have is a Redux for O. So last podcast, we had a look at that and we had the um, RC version, I believe. This time around, we had the final release and um, the summary of it is essentially is going to be a lot like React uh, 15 to 16. There is not a lot of user facing changes, but a lot of re-implementation and improvements under the hood. 
which is really interesting. So essentially it seems to be like a rewrite of the project, um, which made a lot of things nicer to code against, I guess. And that's always welcome. You know, it's like the refactoring is an important part of the life cycle. So yeah, there you go. All right, we got Atom126, which for whatever reason highlights GitHub package improvements, which is not even part of like, I mean, I guess it's pre-installed to Atom, but that's like incredibly boring. Um, I like, I don't know those, the, you know, after reading those incredible release notes for VS code, Atom releases just seem straight up boring. So I like, yeah, I guess, you know, if you use Atom, great, they released a new version. Doesn't seem like they really improved much beyond the GitHub package, which is like, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, all right. So next thing we have is Svelte version two. Um, this is a web framework for, um, how, well, I think the tagline is really cool. I liked it a lot, the magical disappearing UI framework. So the idea is that if you never heard about it, is that it takes your templates and turns them into a tiny framework class vanilla JavaScript things, which is, um, seems to be working extremely well for um, a lot of different ecosystems. I believe they are now using it in, in Ruby, uh, Ruby on Rails or something like this. Yeah, there is the major version uh, dropping EA11 again. I mean, a lot of people have been doing that, but it's like EA11 is end of life now. So, you know, whatever. I don't think a lot of people are using it anymore. So it's it's good to see more more sort of major frameworks doing that. Uh, but yeah, if that's our cup of tea, have a look. Okay. Um, Node.js 10 is now a uh, release candidate. So there's actually been more than one now, I believe. I have not checked. So this was the last tweet I saw was the second release candidate. I don't know if there's a third one already, maybe or more. Uh, so this pull request, okay, this is a 10.0 proposal. So I guess if there will be more, we would see. So it seems like it's just the RC2 for now. But yeah, I mean, we're really close to Node 10 complete release, which is really damn exciting because it has a lot of really cool things and uh, V866, which is gonna bring a lot of optimizations to the table. So it is really, really cool. Okay, I think that's it for releases. So next thing we have um, demo reel essentially, demos, libraries, and websites. And the first thing we have here is called ViewPress and it's a view powered static website generator, uh, which seems to be very nicely designed in terms of user experience and seems to be quite easy to use. So, if you like view, if you like, if you need to generate a static website, then definitely have a look at that because this is literally all you have to do. It seems to be extremely easy. It works with Markdown. So, you know, that looks like another great tool for static website generation. I think this website is actually generated by using ViewPress. So always cool. All right, uh, yet another D3.js resource. Uh, this is called D3 In-Depth and it's a collection of free tutorials that um, introduce you to different D3.js concepts from the basic introductions to selections, data joins, and exit nodes, scale functions, shapes, layouts, geographic stuff. And they also have a bunch of upcoming lessons that are still not done, but will be done at some point. So once again, if you wanted to get into D3.js, that sounds like a really great resource for starters, or if you wanted to learn more things about like geographic layout, for example, uh, my stuff is probably blocked. Come on, there we go. There's a very nice visualization of a globe. Probably, I mean, this is done in D3.js and you can view source as usual and uh, inspect all of that and see how exactly it's done. This is extremely tiny, extremely tiny code for a globe, okay. Yeah, so it's a pretty neat website. Okay, next thing we got is called YOLJS. I I'm I refuse to pronounce it in any other way. It's gonna be YOLJS. <laughs> and it's a fast, flexible, and small image lazy loader. So and it's literally yet another lazy loader. If you need to lazy load images and if you are very lazy and if you just want, you know, do it in literally one line, it's like all you have to do is import the script and say 
document that even listener can download it y'all that's it and it will work you can obviously specify options if you want but uh, that's a different story yeah it's very easy to set up seems to be very minimal and seems to be quite nice so if you're looking for one do have a look at that right continuing we got another library from luke edwards the guy behind polka and a bunch of other libraries that i already introduced here he created an es6 based or i guess map from es6 based te uh, temporary cache called tmp cache there's a link to the uh, um, to the library from the tweet it is just 35 lines of code and is basically what you expect it to be works pretty well have all you need and it is extremely tiny i don't know how many like 35 lines of code is what it's going to be like few bytes <laughs> like this guy is crazy about optimization um i would love to know how did you set up your bash and hyper on windows can you share the dot files did you install powerline phones i did not install any powerline phones i basically installed vsl i installed fish so this is actually the fish shell uh whoops it's already okay, i guess i launched it a second time uh i was lazy to set up my z shell here because i used to wipe the vsl quite frequently while it was in beta i probably should do that now but this is essentially just straight up hyper with fish installed and that's it i don't really have any dot files or anything like that so it just works out of the box pretty nice um yeah all right um let's continue we got react check auth it's um authentication protection anywhere in your react react native app and it is uses new context api hey everyone uses this now that's really cool because it allows you to do it just in 100 lines of code which is great um so you add this auth provider which basically refers to some website right and then whenever you have a protected route, you just use it with consumer and that's it. Very straightforward, very simple. Obviously, you can uh, specify different uh, success. I, I don't know, if, is there a way to specify logic? It seems to be reliant on the like Zach request options. Um, yeah, you can provide some options. But yeah, basically, you know, if you're looking for a very straightforward approach of doing that, that seems like a way to go. Um, it's very curious to see what sort of things people use for uh, the context API for, put it this way. So yeah. All right, um, what's up, cat? Next thing we have is a mail train, a self-hosted newsletter app. So if you ever wanted to self-host and send out the newsletter, which is, I mean, I wouldn't say a bad idea, but man, you will have some problems. <laughs> with getting your email whitelisted if you send a lot of emails. Uh, then mail train seems like a nice uh, option. So there's a subscriber list management, list segmentation, custom fields, email templates, and CSV list imports. Um, basically all you wanna, all you might need to have and the requirements seem to be quite small. I mean, although you know, one gig of RAM is like, I don't know why you would need that. There are also Docker file and Docker compose file that you can easily use to deploy it, uh, which is always nice to have. And there's like additional docs and everything. Uh, GPL, EUPL and MIT, that is, that is, they ch okay, that is something I haven't seen before, but they changed the licenses every other version. So that's a bit interesting. Okay, right. But you know, that seems like an um, interesting tool if you if you have a problem like this. All right, continuing, we got Jess Puppeteer. It's essentially a um, wrapper for Jess that's, uh, or I guess configuration for Jest that allows you to run Jest alongside with Puppeteer. Not that it's really hard to do on your own, but it does take some time to set it up. So it's always nice when there's just a complete solution for that. So if you was looking to do that or was maybe you already have done that, but you wanna simplify it, then there's your option. So it's uh, pretty neat. Okay, and the last thing that we have today in the demos and libraries section is the new app from Google guys. It's called Grasshopper and it aims to teach beginners to code on a mobile phone. And it actually is a gamified coding thing uh, that teaches you JavaScript specifically. This is why it's on our podcast in the first place. 
and it seems to be pretty well made. Uh, there's a lot of people who are very happy about it. You can get it both on uh, iPhone and Android phones. And uh, yeah, if you are looking to um, exercise, I think it's absolutely free, no ads or any other bonkers. And you know, it seems to be working quite well. Do we'll have a look at that. Okay, before we wrap the podcast up, we have a couple of very stupid things. First, um, this is not JavaScript related, but this is so incredible that I just could not not show it off. So hackers stole a casino's high roller database through a thermometer in a lobby fish tank. Just think about that for a second. Um, going in details. So the casino has a fish tank in the lobby, right? And the casino has a thermostat. The thermostat is connected to the network. And the network is very secure, but the thermostat is not. So what the... <coughs> my apologies. What the hackers do is they hack the thermostat. They use the thermostat as a jump point. They jump from the thermostat into the database because then it's considered intranet. They steal all the files and download them through a thermostat to their machine. It is, it is just insane. Like I... It's like, I don't know, like, yeah, they get the foothold in the network and then, and then they just pull the database across the network out the thermostat up to the cloud. And just reading this blows my mind. It's like, um, I wonder how many cases like this we're going to see. This is like some, there's this Twitter uh, called Internet of Shit and they typically tweet stuff like this. And it is just incredible how many IoT devices that you think are absolutely harmless and you just be like, oh, there's, you know, just a thermostat in the fish tank. I'm just going to connect it to see my stats in my phone. And then, and then your database gets dragged through that thermostat. It's just, I mean, it's just insane. And yes, talking about the Internet of Shit Twitter, here's another really good one from it. Again, this is not directly JavaScript related, but I found it super funny. Uh, how many servers could it take to turn on a light bulb? And then there's a diagram from Philips. And if you didn't know, they do the smart light bulbs that you can control with like Alexa, Google Assistant, whatever, Siri. And uh, on one hand, looking at this image, I understand why you need all of that, right? Because you have this really complex infrastructure. On other hand, it is insane to think that you need all of that to just turn on one light bulb. <laughs> Like, this is crazy. But then, you know, as a software like system architect, I understand why all of that is needed because it's not just about one light bulb, right? It's about a system of bulb. But yes, we need Redis, Kubernetes, Google Cloud Platform, and a bunch of other very high-tech things, Elasticsearch to just turn on a light bulb. <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, um, usually doing something like that, the hackers must have had prior knowledge of how it works. Uh, obviously, I mean, you always need some sort of a prior knowledge to pull something like this off, right? But it's still amazing that you could actually get, like, make a thermostat your entry point in the not in the protected network of casino. <laughs> it's just the whole, like, you literally hack the casino through the fish. <laughs> it's <laughs> okay. Um, right. I think that's it from my side, basically. So unless you guys have any other cool links that I maybe missed during this week, or you have some other things that you want to talk about or discuss, we can basically wrap it up here for today. Uh, there was a pretty productive podcast and we had a lot of really cool news, I think. So you have a couple of seconds, um, AnimeJS. I think that's an old one, right? I, I believe I saw it already quite some time ago. Yeah, it is an old one, yeah. It's a very fancy animation framework. It's a really cool one, but it's definitely not a new one. Uh, I, I've used it in some, like I've used it in one of my projects. It was really cool. How do you find the time to read all the articles? Well, to be honest, it's gotten very tough. So uh, with the uh, Entrepreneur First program, I'm traveling most of the time. And what I do right now is I've stored them all. So I have this, uh, whoops, no. I have this, uh, my new tiny project management thingy that I wrote for myself. So what I do is I throw all those links here and usually there's a lot more than what you see here for each of the episodes. I throw them in, then I just collect them over the week and then 
on Saturday, I just sit down and just read through all of that stuff and filter out the garbage that is completely boring on that I already saw or that is just non-relevant. And I, I mean, it takes a couple of hours. I mean, I'm, I'm very fast. At, so I'm a very fast reader. So that's typically not a huge problem for me. But um, yeah, collecting it is usually the, the most uh, tiresome process, right? Because you have to like track news every day. You have to look, I, like most of, of the news I get from Twitter. So like the people I follow on Twitter and uh, yeah. Uh, you do get access to the links, absolutely. They are published under BXJS Weekly, uh, come on GitHub, episodes over here. This is for the current episode. I can share it in chat, there you go. So all of those links are, and the prior episodes are shared on GitHub. Uh, I probably should put a link to the Twitch in the description. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. But uh, yes, uh, so, all the links are publicly shared, obviously. I don't have any reason to hide them from you, really. Uh, so yeah, I'm, you know, reading and uh, going through the links is not the major problem, but collecting them all is quite a problem. So I would say uh, my main source of the news for now is all the people I follow on Twitter that post different crazy things. And uh, luckily I follow a lot, a lot of JavaScript people and some people who share dogs. <laughs> That's the thing as well. All right. Do you guys have anything else you want to discuss? Any maybe questions to me about uh, processes, JavaScript work, my computer setup, extensions, whatever comes to your mind. It's like, I'm, I'm open to answer anything. Okay. Um, doesn't really seem to be the case, I guess. So that was um, pretty productive. Uh, we had a nice podcast. Looks like, um, what stack do you use from back to front? Um, that depends on the project. So I don't have a prefix stack. Like 90% of cases, I would just take Node.js and React and uh, Next.js, like this is literally my favorite framework and uh, the thing that I use for most of the apps but um, it's heavily depends on the project. So I'm not limited to just coding JavaScript, right? So like, for example, we have this project running right now, which is called Hobbit. It's a U funded uh, holistic benchmarking for Bing Click data. And because of our partners and because of some of the things that are like done in linked data, like are done in Java, this whole project is written in Java. So, you know, I have to, program Java for some time, which is a bit painful from time to time. I really hate object oriented programming, especially in Java, but um, you know, if I have to do it, I will do it. So um, I also did some stuff in Golang, uh, did some programming in Python. It's like, again, you know, whatever fits the purpose. I don't think that limiting yourself to one specific language is a good idea in general. I would say something like this. All right, any other questions or things to talk about? Let me have a look. Okay, uh, that is probably not what I want to do. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, should I? Uh, I like next, but don't you think it's a disadvantage that it's unnecessary code splits every page you have to load JS yes, every time you switch a page? Um, that, I mean, first of all, that's not exactly how code splitting works there, right? Because it doesn't just splits every page. You have the vendor dependents that are shared, which will always load the same way. So it uses the webpack code splitting and, um, on one hand, it might be viewed as a disadvantage, but on one, on the other hand, it might be actually an advantage because if the one of your users only accesses one page, he doesn't have to download all the other pages. So you always have trade-offs. But uh, from my perspective, like I've yet to have an app that is so large that code splitting becomes a problem, right? So in my cases, Next.js, I, I always pick Next.js because of the developer speed it provides, right? Because I can. It literally takes like 10 seconds to get the app started and working, like at least the hello world and the basic app, right? So 
if I sacrifice a bit of load times for that, I can do that. So like if, if I hit some sort of problems at the end with the code splitting, I always have an option to patch in my own Webpack config, right? Because you can do your own Webpack config and you can configure your own um, code splitting. So, you know, that's I don't think that's a huge problem. All right. Um, okay, cool. Glad I was able to answer your question. Um, is there anything else you guys want to discuss or um, any other questions you have regarding anything basically, really? Okay, um, yeah, I think we went through all of that stuff and it was good. It's episode seven, holy crap, time flies. <laughs> okay. Doesn't seem like chat has any other questions here. So um, I think it's a good point to wrap it up. That was BXGS Weekly episode seven. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for asking your questions. And I see you next week for more awesome JavaScript news. Have a nice Sunday, I guess. And have a nice evening. And I see you next time. Bye.